بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين سبحان الله العلي العظيم نحمده ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من سيئات اعمالنا ومن شرور انفسنا يا رب يا رب نسالك ان تقسم لنا من خشيتك ما يحول بيننا وبين معاصيك ونسالك ان تقسم لنا من رحمتك ما يقربنا من طاعتك ونسألك يا رب أن ترزقنا أن ترزقنا أن ترزقنا من اليقين ما يهون علينا مصائب الدنيا وأحداثها ونسألك يا رب أن لا تجعل همنا دنيانا وأن لا تجعل دنيانا مبلغ عنا وأن لا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ونصلي ونسلم ونبارك على محمد النبي الأمين المرسل رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وأصحابه وعلى من اتبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين All praise All praise to God The one and only The beginner of everything The creator of the heavens and the earth The anchor of our lives And we pray for peace and blessings upon all the prophets of God and the Prophet Muhammad One cannot fail to notice that Ramadan is just a few days away. And it is indeed an unusual Ramadan. Already Taraweeh prayers will not be possible in mosques. One of the main One of the main if um, uh, I don't want to say festivities because it's not really a festivity, but one of the main events and act- activities of Ramadan is that you indeed feel a certain bond of camaraderie of affinity with fellow Muslims as you go to the mosque to pray taraweeh and a certain air of um, certain air of blessings and light that comes from the prayers and the breaking of fast in Ramadan and we are all challenged and tried this Ramadan to do everything from home. Uh, 
And this Ramadan, there is also another major event that all of us Muslims are experiencing. And that is whether we are on Umrah or Hajj this year or not, the fact of the matter is, is that the prayer, Ramadan, the Taraweeh prayer, and Hajj and Umrah, well, Hajj hasn't been officially been canceled yet, but it will likely, very likely, in my opinion, be canceled, and Umrah is not already possible. So Mecca and Medina are effectively under lockdown. And this, for a variety of reasons, is a momentous um, occurrence. It, um, it hasn't occurred in centuries. While we can't say it never occurred before, but it hasn't occurred in centuries that Taraweeh prayers and Umrah and Hajj have been suspended. Even during the Napoleonic invasions, when Napoleon invaded the Muslim world and invaded Egypt and went up the coast to Palestine, attempting to reach Jerusalem, although Egypt canceled its official campaign or official caravan that traveled uh, with the Hajj, with those who are doing Hajj to Mecca and Medina, there were locally organized various groups of people from around the Muslim world who still made it to Mecca and Medina for Hajj. And in my view, it is not just the fact that something is officially canceled, but when Mecca and Medina are empty and the mosques are empty, there is there is a huge sacrifice that most, the Muslim Ummah collectively makes. And that's a sacrifice of blessings, the barakat of people praying and supplicating and doing dhikr and doing dua. We cannot, we cannot pay a cost like that without reflecting very seriously upon what Allah is telling us through a pandemic like this. It is not just irresponsible but it is a form of kufr. It is a form of truly not believing in Allah as a fully involved creator. It's either events just happen willy-nilly and God is not involved and God is sort of a casual, uninterested observer. Some Muslims talk about things in that way. They, they, they talk about material events, the unfolding of things, never taking God's role in the equation. And when you do so, it is as if God is an uninterested creator as if God basically just lets things occur aimlessly and pointlessly. While a wiser Muslim 
and I believe a more pious Muslim would understand that nothing occurs on the face of this earth or in the heavens without having a meticulous cause behind it and the source of that cause is God. And when there is a pandemic like this that is going to affect all of our Ramadan and the entire nature of Ramadan it is incumbent on us to think, to make sure that this cost is not paid, the cost that we all will pay in baraka, in the loss of baraka, in the loss of an opportunity. One, to reflect upon what God is telling us through this pandemic. And two, we are under an obligation to prove to God our commitment before such a challenge. Notice that, and I've dealt with this in, a, in another khutbah, this pandemic has already provided a bitter commentary, a bitter commentary over the way we human beings use resources. When the cost is so high that it forces us to close our mosques and to put the economic well-being and emotional well-being, leave alone the physical and mental well-being of so many human beings at risk. We cannot fail to notice, and I've already addressed this in another khutbah, that the pandemic, is clearly pointing a finger at the way that we use resources collectively as human beings. At a minimum, treatment from an illness like that is if the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah has created a cure for every disease, there is no disease on the face of this earth without a cure created by Allah. And it is incumbent on our obligation, on our taklif, to do the research to find the cure for that disease. To find a world which spends an enormous amount of money on so many thrills and luxury items and military hardware and means of destruction and even research that might satisfy our vanity before satisfying or our lust for knowledge rather before satisfying the basic needs of human beings is a very serious matter. For a country like the United States to be losing thousands of people every day because medical equipment, basic medical equipment is not available is a sin 
and it should be understood as a sin. The inequity between the rich and the poor and the inequities between the races is overwhelming. And again, I'm still talking about a country like the United States. The fact that some of us can stay at home and it is perhaps an annoyance, an inconvenience, but for so many of us, when you say to your kids, stay at home, it is not simply a matter of hanging out on the net or on social media or on video games because in the United States we have a lot of families that cannot even afford to bill, pay the bill for a good a good network connection or cannot even afford the whole process of... So, in fact, the children are put themselves into danger because they get bored and they figure, they manage to find a way to get out, to violate the stay-at-home. Or, in even worse situations, the children have jobs that provide essential income for their families. And so they continue working in supermarkets or in grocery stores or... And we've seen a stark reality in that the pandemic has affected racial minorities in the U.S. far more than it has affected... And when I say far more, I mean percentage-wise. If you approach this Ramadan without the consciousness of what Allah is telling us through a pandemic, without the consciousness, we pray. Among one of the first prayers taught in Islam, one of the basic prayers that the Prophet والسلام, was taught, and one of the basic prayers that the Prophet والسلام, taught all Muslims, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ First two words, Allah wants adl, justice, and beyond justice, ihsan, beauty, goodness, if you're smart, you would pray to Allah and say, Allah, لا تعام, لا تعامني بعدلك. Allah, don't treat me according to your justice. Because if you're smart, you don't want Allah to treat you just justly. Because many of us, if we just want justice, we're not going to do very well. But say, Allah, عامني بإحسانك. Allah, treat me according to your goodness, to your beauty. Don't give me what I deserve, because if you give me what I deserve, I'm not going to do very well. Give me beyond justice, kindness, beauty, goodness. So one of these are, one of the first things we that the Prophet ﷺ was taught, and one of the first things that the Prophet taught Muslims, it is one of the essential cores, the pulse of Islam. Often you, what we wonder, what made the first generation of Muslims such a powerful force that unfolded upon the world? If the first generation of Muslims were taught to be 
technical literalists. If they were taught to be text readers, in other words, if Islam came and said, well, you know, what you're chored with is to figure out precisely the ins and outs of this text or that text. In other words, if they were all taught to be lawyers, Islam would have never been, never amounted to anything. The secret for the energy and power that Islam gave to its first generation, the Sahaba, is that they were taught to be free men and women, first, freedom, but second, to have a passion for Adl and Ihsan, justice and beauty. One is to understand their worth. That's what freedom is, is that you understand I matter. I am and I am because God assured me I am. But second, to have a passion for justice, every time you come to a human being and say, temper your zeal for justice and beauty. Because first, you have to get permission from this authority or that authority, or you have to first learn how to read a text you break the will of that human being until they lose confidence in themselves. So approach this Ramadan and approach the lessons of the pandemic with the energy of awwal al-Muslimin, the first of Muslims, not with the energy of the muqallidun of today, the imitators of today, not with the energy of the broken Muslim who has to get the permission of a hundred sheikhs before they have one thought in their brain, or they have to get the they have to read a hundred books before they can have a sense of what's right and wrong. The pandemic has closed down our Mecca and Medina and has closed down our mosques. And when something like that happens, Allah is speaking to us. When we say, we recall the fact, one of the questions that very early on, if you read the seerah, if you read the life of the Prophet ﷺ or study it, so many of the people who were curious about the Prophet, this is before they were hijra, before there was anything, they would always ask, what is the nutshell? So many Arabs would come from all over, whether in Mecca, whether in Quraysh or outside, and they'd say, what is the nutshell about th this man's message? Give me the, the, the heart of the matter. And the response you find all over, again and again and again. Yad'u an la ilaha illallah. Well, the nutshell is, he says that there's no God but one God. And what is the second immediately mentioned? And he calls people to ethics. That's the power. Now, this is long before we started developing books of hadith, commentaries on hadith, commentaries on Quran. The, the innate, the innate passion of the first Islam that taught before books of hadith became full with 
things attributed to the Prophet ﷺ saying blind obedience to the ruler and tolerate tyrants and obey tyrants long before that. The, the, the not shows al-adl wal-ihsan, la ilaha illallah al-adl wal-ihsan, and, what, and justice and goodness. And what is it that the Prophet ﷺ taught? The Prophet ﷺ taught that there's no God but God and makarim al-akhlaq. Good character or ethical character. It is only political ideologies that philosophize what we innately know is wrong. We innately know that when blacks are disproportionately dying, well, if you live in a good neighborhood in L.A. County, if you come from Brentwood, and you get corona, you know you're not worried. If you need a ventilator, you're going to get a ventilator. But if you come from an area of Los Angeles that is predominantly black, you are worried. Because there is a very good chance that if you need a ventilator, you're not going to get a ventilator. There was a very stark image that pained me enormously this past week, and I'm sure many of you have seen it. There was a Jordanian journalist who visited in New Jersey a, a, a mosque in New York, and it's not a, it was actually a mosque, it's a mortuary. A Muslim mortuary. And in that Muslim mortuary, the owner of the mortuary says that he's received 50 bodies of Muslims that day or in the past two days. And the, the bodies are obviously covered, but the journalist films the bodies. That thing is on the net. So many Muslims die and continue to die in New York. And why is it that so many Muslims die in New York? Well, one, m many of them are low economic status. These are the guys who work in on cab drivers and in um, low income markets. These are not the rich, rich Muslims who have excellent health insurance or who can stay home because they don't have to worry about paying their bills. These are the Muslims who have jobs that force them to go on the street even during the pandemic until they get infected and infect their families. And as a result, this Muslim mortuary had so many dead bodies that it ran out of caskets. And the owner of the mortuary was complaining that he doesn't know how he's going to bury all these people fast enough because he doesn't have enough caskets. You're going to approach this Ramadan you're going to remember that Mecca and Medina are closed. There are no people circulating around the Kaaba calling upon God to have mercy and blessings upon this earth. No supplications. No dua in Mecca and Medina. Moreover, Angels are not going to be flocking to mosques to bless Taraweeh prayer. And at the same time, you have a stark reality. Rest assured, that in underdeveloped countries, people die of corona 
simply unreported and unnoticed. So it's not like that the death rates in Italy are much higher or, or, or all these crazy theories that somehow Italy and, and, and Spain, and they, they have serious deaths, but African countries don't. The reality is, is that African countries have, probably have higher death rates than Italy and Spain. It's just no one cares and no one reports it. You enter this Ramadan, don't present yourself to Allah as a fool and an idiot who doesn't reflect upon Adl and Ihsan. That I worry about. If you do your prayer and you don't even present yourself before Allah as someone who is concerned about Adl and Ihsan, before we even get to the point of what you do about it, Don't be so unjust to yourself. Don't be a zalim li nafsi. Because that is a very ugly zone. You can't simply fast and then break fast and lose sight of the fact. While your fast might be optional, I saw a video recently. I can't always understand what's being said because of my hearing. It has to be um, subtitled, otherwise I, I don't. But from what I understood from what was going on, it was a, a, a child was asking his parents that he, he was crying because he wanted peanut, uh, peanut, uh, peanut butter, called peanut butter. He wanted peanut butter on on his sandwich, and the parent was saying that. The, the can't the the parent obviously was out of work and and money is running low and the parent was saying well, we we can't buy peanut butter anymore and and I it it it, it bothered me enormously because there are so many children that even can't have some basic thing they're just bread you can't enter this Ramadan without a living conscience. <laughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين سبحان الله العلي العظيم خالق السماوات والأرض والصلاة والسلام على محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وانتبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين The mosques are closed Turn your homes into mosques. Make an effort to pray together as a family this Ramadan. To discuss issues of adl and ihsan, justice and goodness collectively as a family. Make an effort to remind each other of those who are in need and to talk as a family about what you can do to help those who are in need. I assure you that some of you who are listening to me, and perhaps myself, by the end of this Ramadan, Some of you who have jobs will lose the jobs. Some of you who have health will lose the health. Some of you who have life will have lost their lives. Remember, remember that. Remember that it is, if not for the support and blessing that comes from Allah in a flicker of a second, 
you can join the ranks of those that you pity. That's the reality. That's the truth. And a wise person, as Allah reminds us repeatedly in the Quran over and over and over, a wise person gets his place with Allah settled, meaning you fix your relationship with Allah before things get desperate. When you befriend Allah out of choice because you came to God when things were good, it's a very different situation when, when you, than when you are forced to befriend Allah because you ran out of friends. Because you lost your job, because your child became sick, because your parents got sick, because love, you, you now need Allah and you come and you try to pretend that Allah, we, we've always been friends. Allah is the most forgiving, yes, but there is a big difference between someone who had become a friend out of choice than when someone that tried to force a friendship out of necessity. It is Ad and Ihsan the impulse that should animate every Muslim justice and goodness that was the reason for another thing that I want to comment on. First, maybe let me tell you a short um, a short story from the life of the Prophet As many of you know, when the Prophet ﷺ was in Mecca, he had undergone escalating persecution. The persecution got to the point where there were tons of Muslims who were imprisoned and tortured. Some of them, the torture was so severe that it actually forced them to either pretend not to be Muslims anymore or to in fact give up on Islam and apostate altogether. Some like Bilal who was burned on the hot sand of the desert. Others had, were, were with hot pieces of iron that were heated up and, and laid on top of their heads. In other words, the torture was grisly and the torture kept escalating, especially among the poorest Muslims and the Muslims without strong tribal affiliations. But even those like Abu Bakr Siddiq and the Prophet ﷺ himself who, who came from Banu Hashim and Al Abdul Muttalib, a, a, a strong families and strong clans with, with a strong tribe. The Prophet himself and Abu Bakr Siddiq were repeatedly assaulted and beaten. Eventually, there is an economic big boycott that nearly starves all Muslims to death. It 
few Muslims had actually starved to death, but the majority starved to the point of looking like starving human beings, but at least not to death. Anyway, in the midst of these stories of escalation of persecution against Muslims, it had become quite common to read about the Prophet ﷺ leaving his home and going to where the, the Kaaba, where the, the elders of Quraysh sat, and would often go there trying to, to teach Islam to either residents of Mecca or to those who have come out from outside of Mecca to trade. But what would often happen is that the Meccans would see the Prophet trying to invite people to Islam and would assault him or make fun of him, calling him insane, start singing or whistling or clapping around him so that he can't talk to people. There was one man, I forgot his name, who used to make obnoxious snorting sounds around the Prophet to make fun of him and cover it over him uh, so that the Prophet, as he's trying to recite the Quran to people, they can't hear him because of all the, the, the um, snorting sounds and so on. Okay. So in one of these days, The Prophet come, comes out. We once again have Meccans jeering and sneering and mocking and so on. And he keeps trying and then he eventually stops. The, uh, uh, I don't want to say give, gives up, but he takes a break. He goes and he, he walks away from them and sits down. I've often wondered if the strength of a human being, when you know that every day you leave your home, every day people are going to mock you and laugh at you and throw stones at you. And if you manage to convince someone to follow you, the likelihood is that they're going to be arrested and tortured is very high. I've often wondered about the strength of this human being. But this is not what I'm going to focus on today. One of these days, so he, I, I, as I said, he goes out, he leaves his home, he, the same thing happens, and then he goes and he sits away from Abu Jahl, who, who was there at the, the, that day, and uh, Aswad uh, ibn Abdul Muttalib was also among the the the, the um, among the the bunch of obnoxious people that had made fun of him and uh, fun of him and harassed him, and Al Hakam ibn, ibn Al As and others. Anyway. So in comes a man identified in the sources only as an Irashi. An Irashi is not a name, it's, it's a, um, an indication of where, where he's from, but anyway. So an Irashi walks into Mecca, and Mecca was known for the fact that it treated disempowered people very unjustly and unfairly. And al Irashi starts complaining that he had a business deal with Abu Jahl. He had sold Abu Jahl a camel, and Abu Jahl paid them back, on, paid them only part of the price for the camel, and then told him, get lost. I'm not going to pay you the rest. And al Irashi goes to the elders of Mecca, and he says, help me, help me. Abu Jahl stole my money. I need the money, etc., etc., Typical reactions from the rich people of Mecca is that they started laughing at him. 
because they knew that if you do business with the one of the powerful people, one of the, 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 the and they cheat you, well, tough luck. So they started smiling and jeering, and then they wanted to have some fun. So they told him, do you see that man sitting over there? And who were they pointing at? They were pointing at Muhammad. He didn't know who Muhammad was. He said, do you see that man over there? You know what? He'll help you. Go complain to him. Now they thought that this is going to be very comical. Because Muhammad is persecuted. No one listens to him among the elders of Mecca. It is Abu Jahl, one of Muhammad's biggest enemies, who swindled this man. And they thought that he'll go complain to Muhammad and they'll get a laugh because... Muhammad will be able to do nothing. Muhammad can't even help his followers or help himself. How is he going to help a stranger who's been cheated in a business deal? But Al-Arashi didn't know who Muhammad was and was a foreigner to Mecca, so he says, oh, okay, well, this is the person I talked to, yes, go talk to him. So they go talk he goes and he calls upon the Prophet and he says, I sold the camel to Al Hakam Abu Jahl and he paid me only part of the price. I don't know, I'm a stranger, I have no resources, etc. etc. The Meccans were expecting the Prophet says, you know, there's an, I'm very sorry, but there's nothing I can do for you. And then they would get a laugh. It has always stayed with me that instead, when the Prophet heard that, now remember, this man is not a Muslim, is not a native to Mecca, and the Prophet doesn't even know him. When the Prophet hears about this injustice, he tells him, come with me. And he takes the man by hand, goes and knocks at Abu Jahl's front door. Abu Jahl opens the door and Muhammad confronts Abu Jahl. And he says, by what right do you cheat this man, pay him what you owe him? This story, by the way, continues on that, in fact, Abu Jahl did pay the man, and when his uh, friends blamed Abu Jahl for, he said, when, when you do this, when you actually pay the man because Muhammad confronted you, you, you're giving weight to Muhammad, and this is not what we want to do. And he said, I, I, I don't know. He spoke with such strength and resolve at that moment, it terrified me. I've always paused at this story because this is, Muhammad was at a time where he had every reason to tell this man, an Irashi, listen, guy, my friend, there's so much injustice in Mecca everywhere. Do you know what's happening to my fellow Muslims? Do you know that they're being tortured every day? I am personally, Muhammad, I'm being I'm made fun of every single day. The, Muhammad had every reason to tell the man, I'm very sorry, but I can't help you. Instead, again, a man he didn't know, the principle of who is a Muslim. What is a Muslim? What is a Muslim about? The purity of the story is in its intuitive sense. Before law, before theology, 
before institutions, before it's it's one of the earliest narratives that we have about the earliest pristine reactions of the Prophet ﷺ. If you truly study the seerah, the life of the Prophet ﷺ, you find that in fact, if you want to get to the core, among the first things that Allah taught the Prophet ﷺ, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَإِتَاءِ ذُو الْقُرْبَى but the, the first two items, justice and ihsan and goodness, beauty, as usual, I run out of time before I even get through half of what I wanted to say. But notice That at this coming Ramadan, when Hajj and Umrah have been, Mecca and Medina have been closed, so many mosques have been closed. Some of you might have seen the video I posted about the murder of Abdul Rahim al Hawaiti. A man from the Tabuk province who was ordered by the Saudi government to leave his home because of the, the because Muhammad bin Salman wants to develop the Neom project and when he refuses he's ultimately killed and watch the, the, the video that I posted. But one of the things that struck me about this entire event, one, I want to say, it would have been much easier to not touch a topic like this. Because as I watched the videos that this man posted and other videos posted by the Hawiyatat tribe in Saudi, it was the, the man predicts, he says, you know, it's quite likely that they're going to kill me and then do as Egyptians do. After they kill me, they put a gun next to my body and, and claim that I resisted arrest and that they had to, to, to kill me because of that. So the man predicts what's going to happen to him. And as I listened to the, to the various videos that this man posted, when I heard them say two things, when I heard them say that Saudi Arabia has been plagued by rulers who are like kids, like children, directed at Muhammad bin Salman, I knew that this man was as good as dead. And when I heard them say that, you know, they might kill me and put a gun next to my body, I thought to myself, well, that's what the Egyptians do all the time. And that's what despots have done. They kill people. And then after the fact, they say, well, they, they, they cause their own death somehow. And it would have been much easier for me because I knew that the Saudi government was going to say, ultimately... He's a terrorist. It's much easier for me to keep silent. No, remember this for all those out there. No scholar, no scholar cherishes the opportunity to pick a fight with an unjust government. If you don't know it, well, it's time that you know it that there is a very high price that all academics pay when they decide to clash with an unjust government, whether that government is in the United States, whether it's in China, whether it's in Russia, whether it's in Syria, in Egypt, in Saudi, in the Emirat, in wherever it may be, there is a price to be paid. 
the best academics, the, the academics, I'm saying, the, the academics who pay the least cost are the ones that speak theory and abstractions but clash with no one. When you speak about an event like the Huwaitat, where it's something like the Neon Project is concerned, and the deal of the century is concerned, and Jared Kushner is concerned, and Donald Trump is concerned, the price that you're going to pay, even if Saudi Arabia can't hurt you, you're not going to get a contract by Carnegie Institute, you're not going to get a contract from the Rand Corporation, you're not going to get a contract from Brookings Institute, that means lost income, that means your salary, your income, your, your, your gain. That also means the loss of prestigious lectures. There are lectures that you get that you do for free. There are lectures that offer you an honorarium of $100. But then the lectures that really matter are the ones that offer you $10,000. You know when you speak up defending a poor Bedouin guy like Al-Hitat, that you are as good as signing off on the prestigious lectures that are going to pay you a $10,000 and $20,000 honorarium. Because the reality of the matter, Adl and Ihsan have a high price. Powerful people don't like those who speak about Adl and Ihsan. Now, why am I bringing this up at the end of the khutbah? Well, other than the fact that I ran out of time. But here's the thing. It blows your mind that at a time that when this pandemic has forced us to close down Mecca and Medina, any government that knows the responsibility of taking care of the holy sites and ha would be preoccupied with fighting the pandemic and with trying to figure out a way to as soon as possible safely reopen the holy sites. But it is obvious that the Saudi government, the custodian of the two holy sites, while it has Mecca and Medina as closed, is using the, the, the environment for the pandemic to quietly empty out the Tabuk province for the Neon project. And there is something that is viscerally offensive in this. At the time that we see Mecca and Medina empty, the Kaaba empty, the, 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 the great side of the Prophet والسلام, empty, and you are going throwing people out of their homes everywhere in the world. Governments are telling their people, stay home. Stay home. You're going to Huwaitat and telling them, get out of your homes. What injustice, what ugliness. It is our business. Because as Muslims, yes, we could be like exactly like those that the kuffar wanted. A man who suffered injustice and he goes and he tells the Prophet and the Prophet would tell him, oh, go, go away, I'm, I'm, I have enough problems as it is. But that Islam would have never inspired anyone to build anything, or to become anything. Islam is a passion for justice and beauty. Islam is a passion for the disempowered. Islam is a constant call upon the conscience to stand by those who suffer injustice against those who inflict injustice. This is why, as little as it is to, to record a little statement to say 
How dare you, when the entire world is suffering a pandemic, when the Mecca and Medina are closed, and then you're sending your security forces to kick people out of their homes? Leave alone the fact that it violates international law, the, the, the forced migration, and it, leave alone that the man in, 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 in his recording says, we've tried to resort to courts, and courts basically are under political orders not to, to even attempt to listen to us. Either we have to accept the conditions given to us by the Saudi government or, and, and leave our homes, or we go to prison or die. An ugliness that cannot come. And let me tell you that I believe that the Saudi government, even more than any other government in the world, as long as they've accepted the responsibility of being the caretakers of the Mecca and Medina, and as long as they claim that right exclusively, they don't allow anyone no other country to take a role insists that it is the sovereign domain of the Saudi government. The Saudi government is under an obligation to uphold the standards of Islam more than any other government in the world. And when I see them do what they did with a man from the Huitat family, Abdul Rahim al Huitan. When I see the way that they execute people in prison, the mere, the simple death rates, when I see the way that they imprison Muslim scholars, like Sulaiman al Oda and others, when I see the way that they persecute the Shia, yes, the Shia, because I don't believe in the persecution of any sect. When I see the way that they spend money on, yacht, on, on yachts and, and paintings by Da Vinci, money that could have literally saved millions of human beings, when I see the way that they spend money to support dictators in Yemen and Libya and Egypt, I tell myself, Antum Allah, this, this government, is not worthy of Mecca and Medina. They should not have the right to be the custodians of the two holy sites. Allahumma shahad. Allahumma afu'anna. Allahumma akhfir lana. Allahumma arhamna ya rabbal alameen. Allahumma ansur al-Islam wahdi al-Muslimin ya Ali azim. Allah forgive our sins. Allah help guide us to the truth and the light. Help us discharge our duties during this coming Ramadan. Help protect us, protect us and our families. And help us to become better Muslims. Ya Ali, Ya Azim. Inna Allah ya'mur bil adli wal ihsani wa ita'i bil qurba yana al fahshai wal munkar wal baghi. Ya'idukum la'allakum tazakurun. Not to the